And luckily, uh, one of my good friends, Mark Brandenburg, who is here with us tonight to present, um, this is his expertise. He's been doing this work almost his entire legal career. Uh, and as you think about planning for your future and how to protect your assets, I can think of no better person than Mark. Mark is at the top of his field. He went to Emory and Emory Law School, or Washington University, University uh, in St. Louis, and then Emory Law School. And is just a remarkable uh, person, but also an excellent lawyer. So I hope that tonight uh, you learn something. And of course, uh, as you work through your own trust, will, and estate issues, um, don't be um, afraid to call Mark afterwards for assistance. But with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. I want to thank you, Mark, for giving up part of your Friday night for this presentation. I know uh, it will be well received and people are excited to hear from you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Amir, so much. That's such a, a wonderful introduction. Uh, and, I'm, and thank you to everyone who's joining us. Uh, I'm so glad to be here with you this evening. Uh, this is no imposition on me. I, I love uh, sh sharing my knowledge with others. And um, uh, my only regret is that we're not in the same room together, uh, which I'm sure was where this would typically have, have been. Um, but but uh, I'm glad to be able to present to you and, uh, and share um, some things I think will be of interest to you, particularly during this uh, difficult time when uh, so many of us are thinking about our health and our family and our loved ones. Uh, that's really what estate planning is about. And uh, as we go through this evening, um, I think you'll agree with me um, that uh, everyone who's listening and, and those who didn't join us tonight that weren't, uh, weren't able to join us tonight also need estate planning. It's something for everyone. Uh, I am going to have slides that uh, hopefully you can see on your computer screens. Um, if you can't, don't worry. Uh, you can just listen to my voice uh, and, and you'll still get something out of it. But um, uh, you're welcome to, to follow along on the slides as, uh, as I speak. Um, first, I want to begin with what is estate planning? Uh, there are many people I talk to who feel that they don't need estate planning because they don't have an estate. Uh, and that's people who are thinking of an estate as something grand uh, or something for the wealthy. Uh, when in fact, um, everyone has an estate. As long as you own something and, and everyone owns something, you have uh, an estate to manage. Uh, and really estate planning is using the law to your advantage so your healthcare is managed how you want and your property is disposed of how you want. Um, estate planning doesn't just cover uh, transfer of property, it also covers uh, your health care and how that is managed uh, during your life, uh, if, particularly if you face a difficult time uh, with your health. There are some concepts uh, that, that we're going to go over tonight, um, and some of them, you'll see these on your slide, some of them may already be familiar to you, and some of them may not, um, but I wanted to put them here at the beginning so that uh, we could all kind of get familiar with some of the concepts and, and, and if maybe one or two of them are uh, something that you are hoping to hear about, uh, you will. You will hear, will hear about these tonight. Um, we're gonna talk about wills and trusts. We're gonna go over the concept of probate. Uh, we're gonna talk about a concept called intestate, which I will define for you. We're gonna talk about guardianships and conservatorships as well as powers of attorney, advanced directives for healthcare, retirement accounts, and we'll touch on taxes. We won't spend a lot of time on taxes, but we'll touch on them. I do en encourage, uh, if you'd like to ask a question, you're welcome to, um, uh, and the host uh, will, e either you can raise your hand and, and the host may acknowledge you, or you can uh, type a question in the chat. And I'll try to address them during the presentation, but if not, uh, there is going to be some time afterwards for us to um, have a question and answer session. Let's begin with intestate. Intestate means dying without a will. Uh, so anyone in Georgia who dies without a will, and there are many who do, um, is considered to be a person who died intestate. And the reason I begin with this is because I think it's important to know what would happen if you don't have a will in place. And there are many, many people who don't. It doesn't mean that's the right thing for them, but I just know from doing this for many years that, there, that most people don't have wills. Uh, so here's what happens. Um, as long as you own a, an asset that is 
that is considered a probate asset, then Georgia state law will determine who gets that asset. Now, I just mentioned a probate asset. You may be asking, what is a probate asset and what is a non-probate asset? The best way to, to define a probate asset is to tell you what is not a probate asset. All right. Um, a, a not a probate asset is, uh, are things that, that are governed by a contract, like your life insurance policy. And your life insurance policy, when you got it, you filled out a form that designated a beneficiary as to who would get that death benefit when you died. That is, a, uh, that is not a probate asset because your contract governs that. Your retirement accounts are the same way. Uh, retirement accounts are not probate assets because you filled out a form and you can change it periodically if you wish. Uh, you filled out a form with the bank, maybe Charles Schwab or Morgan Stanley or whoever you chose, um, and, and you identified who would receive that retirement account upon your death. The same thing with a joint account. So think about you and your spouse. Maybe you have a joint account, uh, a joint checking account where you pay your utility bills and things like that out of. Uh, as long as there are two people on the account, when one of you dies, the other gets the account automatically. It's not considered a probate asset. Um, however, when, when uh, the survivor of you dies and there's only one name on that account, that is a probate asset because there's no contract that tells uh, anyone where that asset is to go, where that checking account is to go. Uh, and you can also think about owning a house jointly. Uh, many uh, married couples own the house in both their names. Um, if it is a certain kind of ownership called joint tenants with rights of survivorship, that means that when one of you dies, the other gets the property outright. But almost everyone has a probate asset. Think about your car. There's a good chance your car is not owned uh, in, in both you and your spouse's name, just your name. Or maybe you're a widower and everything is in your name. Or maybe you and your spouse just have a lot of things that are your own. Uh, you know, one of you has a brokerage account, and one of you, uh, you know, and the other has another brokerage account. So these are all things that are probate assets. So what happens to those when you die without a will? Georgia state law determines who gets them, and the state law tries to identify who they think you want to get the assets, uh, which would be your spouse and your children. Um, your spouse will never get less than one third. Um, so if you have three children, your spouse still gets one third and the remaining two thirds are divided up among your children. That may sound okay that your spouse and your children get your stuff because that's probably what you wanted anyway, uh, but it can lead to problems. Um, think about your house, for example. Um, do you really want your adult children to be part owners of your house with your surviving spouse? Probably not. Your adult children may have their own creditor issues. Maybe one of them is going through a divorce and you wouldn't want the house to be a subject to those creditors. Uh, it's even worse if you are a young family and your children are minors. Uh, you don't want minor children owning your house. Uh, and in fact, they can't own your house uh, without having a, a special person appointed to do it for them, which is called a guardian. Um, so that's not a good, a good result. If you're someone who's listening right now and you don't have a spouse and you don't have children, then your parents uh, are next in line to receive your assets. Even if you're estranged from one parent, that parent still is gonna get it. Um, or if your parents are divorced and, uh, and you wouldn't want uh, them to share ownership of your house, for example, uh, they may still own it together. So every family is different and every family uh, may be uh, in a difficult situation if you die without a will. The other thing that happens if you die without a will is that um, someone has to sign on your behalf, sign your name on your behalf in order to transfer assets. Think about how you transfer assets now. Uh, you sign your name on the deed when you, when you sell your house. Um, so somebody has to sign for you. And, uh, and that person, you may be familiar with the term executor uh, in Georgia. If you die with a will, the person who stands in your shoes to sign on your behalf is called an executor. When you die without a will, that person is called an administrator. Whether, you, you're, whether the person is an administrator or an executor, they're still, um, they're still governed by the probate court. 
that's a court that exists in every county in Georgia that oversees estates uh, when someone dies. An administrator is someone that comes forward to be your, uh, to, to take this role over rather than you appointing them. So the court is concerned uh, that maybe this person needs some oversight. So the court requires that person to get a bond, which is like an insurance policy, and there's a premium that comes out of your estate to pay for that. The administrator also has to file returns or reports to the court every year describing um, what they've done for your estate. You know, did, did they sell the house? Did they, um, did they bring in some money into an account and then, and then send it out uh, to, the, to the beneficiaries? Um, so they have to file these reports. Also, initially, uh, an administrator cannot sell property like your house without going back to the court and asking for permission. Right now, uh, the probate courts that I've been working with in Georgia are uh, overburdened with all the work they have and they're moving very slowly. So I'm finding for my clients who are deep into probate that uh, they are having uh, frustrations because the court is not responding as quickly as you would hope. So let's talk about a will. What is a will? A will is a legal declaration of your wishes and it governs the disposition of your property and it takes effect at your death. Tonight, some, we're gonna to talk about some other things that, that are effective while you're alive. So I wanted to make sure that this is clear, that this is a document, of course you sign it while you're alive, but it doesn't have any power until you die. In a will, you can identify your beneficiaries. Those are the people who are gonna receive your probate assets upon your death. You can name your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, you know, your friends, anyone, including charities. Um, if you wanna uh, send, you know, send something to a charity, you can do that. You can also put in a will uh, different contingencies. So if, uh, you know, if, if a tragedy occurred and your spouse and children are not alive anymore at the time you die, um, then would, where would you want your, your assets to go? And you can uh, go through several scenarios um, so that you make sure no matter what, that your assets will go to the place you, you hope it will go, depending on what the future may hold. Importantly in a will, you can also name a guardian for your minor children. If you have minor children, or if some of you listening um, have are thinking about your grandchildren right now and, and uh, knowing that, that your, your adult child doesn't have a will in place. Uh, it's very important for young families to have wills. Uh, you can name uh, the guardian for your minor children if in the event of both of the parents dying, um, then the government will look to that document, that will, to determine who is gonna take care of those minor children until they're 18 years old. And there are many fights that happen between family members. Uh, you know, you can imagine two sets of really loving grandparents who love their grandchildren so much, but don't love each other as much. And, uh, and they fight over um, who's, who's the best set to take care of, of the little kids that are left behind when there's a tragedy that strikes. Um, so naming minor children, uh, naming guardians for minor children is, is so key for young families. Um, you can also name, tr uh, tr you can name the trustee of trusts under your will. So we're gonna talk about trusts in a minute, but um, I wanna just go ahead and, and comment that in your will, you can identify who will be the person in charge, and we call that a fiduciary, the person in charge of trusts uh, or, or the executor of your will. Um, who's going to be the one that you designate to be in charge? And that person you designate doesn't need to get a bond like the administrator does, doesn't need to file reports to the court, and doesn't uh, need to uh, ask for uh, authority to sell property. Because in a will, your lawyer has already written in there that the person you name is trusted and can do the job without these oversights from the government. In a will, you can establish trusts to protect assets. So there are many kinds of trusts and I'll talk about those a bit more in a few minutes. Um, 
but there are certain kind of trusts that I think are really useful uh, in, in a will. Um, for example, if, if you uh, are maybe a younger parent and you are leaving uh, money at your death to your children, whether they're minor children or maybe they're just young, uh, young adults, uh, you can, instead of leaving the inheritance to them outright, where they would uh, immediately be able to put it in their pockets, uh, and, and particularly if you're, we're talking about young adults, maybe, maybe college age kids, uh, you know, where they're going to perhaps mismanage the money and do something foolish with it, you can go ahead and create trusts inside of your will that will hold that money in the event of your death uh, so that your young adult child doesn't mismanage. Um, and you'll name the trustee, maybe that's a, 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 tr a family member or your, your sibling or someone like that, who will um, make sure that the money is well used until your adult child is old enough to do it him, him or herself. What happens uh, when, when, you, when you die with a will? Well, you've named your executor in the will. That's the person you designate to be in charge of your estate and to sign your name on your behalf. The executor must follow the terms of your will. And the executor can be an individual, like, like your family member, or it can be an institution if you don't have anyone uh, that you want to name. The executor is appointed by the judge of the probate court and uh, receives a certificate called letters testamentary. This is after your death, but receives a certificate called letters testamentary. And with that certificate, your executor can sign on your behalf and manage your estate to make sure that your assets go to the person you want. I said at the beginning that I was gonna discuss uh, trusts among some other things. And I do wanna take a moment now to talk about trusts. Uh, there are many, many kinds of trusts. And I often will get a question from um, a, a client or a prospective client uh, saying, I think I need a trust. Um, but they don't necessarily know at that point what kind of trust they need. And they, and they might believe that there are only a few trusts that are available. In fact, there are, there are many, many, many trusts that, that exist uh, in, under our laws. And each category of trust can be uh, designed by your lawyer to meet your specifications. So um, a trust may not be the answer to everything, but um, many times it can be an answer to something. Um, I do also speak with a lot of clients who are a little bit fearful of trusts because they don't understand them. And uh, I want to take a moment to just introduce you to the concept and maybe you won't be as, uh, and you won't be uh, uh, afraid of them if you have the chance to, to talk, to, to uh, work with trusts. So a trust is a relationship. It's a relationship between three parties. The first party is the grantor. The second party is the trustee and the third party is the beneficiary. The grantor is the person who makes a gift, who gives something to the trust. The trustee is the person you've designated as the grantor, the person you've designated to uh, be in charge of the asset that you've gifted. And then the beneficiary is the person who benefits from this gift. Those three parties can be the same person. It is possible. It's also possible that there could be any, uh, any um, number of, of different scenarios. Maybe the trustee and the beneficiary are different um, or the same, but the grantor is someone else. Um, so depending on the kind of trust, you could have a different arrangement. Um, at the bottom of this slide, if you're seeing your slides, uh, you'll see the term revocable living trust. And that is one trust I wanted to talk about in a bit more detail tonight. A revocable living trust is one of those trusts where you, you sign it while you're alive and you are the grantor, the trustee, and the beneficiary. You're all three while you're, while you're alive and have capacity to make decisions. Um, a revocable living trust it can allow you to avoid probate, if that's a desire of yours, um, as long as it's properly funded and maintained. 
And a revocable living trust is a great way to, um, to improve the transfer of assets either while you're incapacitated but alive because uh, you're, you can change trustees very easily uh, privately without going to a court. Um, it's also very helpful uh, upon your death that uh, the revocable living trust basically has a will kind of baked into it. Um, and it describes what happens to those assets that are held by the trust upon your death. And it can be done privately at your death rather than going through the probate court process. So uh, if you're meeting with me or with another estate planning lawyer, I suggest you at least think about a revocable living trust and see if it's right for you. I've mentioned probate a lot already this evening, and I want to go into a little bit more depth about what is probate. The word probate really means to prove. And when we talk about probating a will upon your death, we're talking about a court administered process to ensure that your will is valid. All right, um, the probate court, uh, and there's a probate court in every county in Georgia, their job really is to protect those who can't protect themselves. It's a, a, noble, a noble job, um, although it is government, so it is also bureaucratic uh, at, at times. But um, the, the problem that many of us have with probate is that in order to protect those who can't protect themselves, there are a lot, uh, there's a lot of red tape to make sure that, that the bad apples who might be trying to commit fraud uh, are caught. Uh, the problem is the rest of us have to deal with those protections. So when you die, you can't protect yourself anymore and someone might try to take your stuff. Uh, so that's, uh, that's really the, um, the reason why we have a process under our laws in the state to make sure that your will is vetted by a court and to make sure it's not the product of fraud. Um, what will happen at your death if you, if you have, you know, particularly if you have a will, is, um, is that your surviving family will file your will in the probate court in the county where you were living at the time of your death. And uh, along with that filing, they also include a petition, uh, which a lawyer like me can help with um, so that you don't have to do it on your own. Um, and then the heirs who are the the heirs of yours will consent to the, to the will, um, assuming that they don't have an objection to it. Your heirs are the people we talked about at the beginning of this program when we talked about intestacy. They're the people who would receive your assets if you didn't have a will. Um, so that it is true that if you um, have an estranged relationship with one of your children, for example, and in your will, you write them out, so they don't receive anything. That child still will receive notification of your will and will be able to read the, that they've been excluded um, through this process. And so many people do decide that they want to avoid probate because of, uh, if they have a family relationship like that. And, uh, and that's where they look to that revocable living trust I mentioned earlier. What happens after you die and, and after your executor it becomes in charge of your estate? Your executor's job will be to collect and preserve your assets. So that means uh, you know, change the locks on your house if you li lived alone and, uh, and are, are not leaving a spouse. Um, you know, going to your bank and making sure they're aware that you've died and that your, uh, your accounts are frozen uh, in the short term and then eventually moved over to the executor's protection so they can be distributed appropriately. Um, the executor also is responsible for identifying and paying your creditors. Uh, you, you still, if you owed money before you died, you still have to pay it after your death. Uh, your family doesn't have to pay it out of their own money, but you have to pay it out of your own money. Uh, so your executor has to do that for you. You pay your credit cards and your uh, medical bills and, and utility bills and things like that. And then whatever money is left over after those creditors are paid uh, is distributed to your beneficiaries in accordance with the will, if you, ha if you have a will.
Next, I'm going to talk about retirement accounts. Retirement accounts um, are, as I said at the beginning, retirement accounts are accounts that uh, are contractual and that you designate a beneficiary on. If you're thinking right now that you don't remember doing that, uh, I guarantee you did it when you first set up your retirement account. Um, but it's a good idea to periodically check and see who is the beneficiary of that account. What that means, uh, when I mean a beneficiary, I mean when you die, your retirement account has special provisions uh, that, that, uh, that go into play. And uh, the government wants you to name a, a person who's going to receive that account and eventually have to pay income tax on, on them. Um, and most people will name their spouse, or if not their spouse, they'll name their children uh, to receive those accounts. Um, it is a good idea to check regularly and, and, and maybe every year or so, just make sure that, that uh, your beneficiary is still the person you wanted to, uh, particularly if uh, you've been through a divorce. Um, I, I have personally uh, help, helped clients who have uh, been in a situation where they forgot to change the beneficiary um, from their spouse. And after the divorce, they realized that if they had died, uh, their ex would have received that retirement account. And there's no protection for that. So your ex really could get your retirement account if you didn't uh, change the beneficiary. Uh, many divorce attorneys will remind you, but they don't always see it follow through. All right, let's take a brief moment for taxes. Okay, so <clears throat> taxes. There are income taxes and there are estate taxes that I'm going to talk about tonight. I'm not really going to touch on income taxes, but if you're if you're particularly um, uh, unfamiliar with with taxes, I just want you to, to kind of be able to, to designate the two differences. Income taxes are what you pay every year uh, in April uh, to the IRS because of taxes that that are owed on the money you either earn through your wages or on your investments like dividends that you get from your uh, your, your stocks and bonds. Um, but when you meet with an estate planning attorney and you think about estates, uh, there's a lot of information about, out there about the estate tax. So the estate tax is um, that the government decided many years ago, the US government decided many years ago that they uh, did not want wealth to be passed down from one generation to another um, in huge amounts. And they also realized that they could generate revenue uh, by levying a tax against the wealthy. So they created the estate tax, which said that if you die with a lot of money, uh, the government's going to take a part of it. Um, that law has changed over the last hundred years. And the way it is now is um, is that wealth uh, is defined by how much you can die with without paying a tax at all. And um, right now, you can see on your slide, right now that is $11.58 million tax-free. In, in, uh, and I'm sorry, my slide has an error on there. It says 2019 law. That should say 2020 law. The, uh, the, the dollar amounts are right. It's just the year is wrong on my slide. Um, but the 2020 law is that you can, you can basically die with $11.5 million and not pay an estate tax. And if you're married, you can double that. So you can die with $23 million uh, tax-free um, without paying an estate tax. So for so many people in America, this is not an issue. Um, if you are listening and you have this much money, uh, I highly encourage that you uh, can remember the Persian Cultural Center when it comes to your gift giving. Uh, and, and, uh, and charitable giving. Um, but for so many uh, of us, uh, right now, the estate tax is not an issue. So why do you occasionally hear about it in the news or um, maybe your financial advisor might mention it? It's because the amount that you can die with um, without paying a tax has changed quite frequently over the years. Um, just uh, maybe about 15 years ago, the amount was $600,000 $600, was all that you could die with tax-free. 
And the amount includes in life insurance, by the way. So, you know, even for young families who might have a million dollars in life insurance, just to make sure that uh, if, if a, a, a wage earning spouse dies, that the children and surviving spouse can continue to live the way they were accustomed, could have been subject to an estate tax. Um, so so it, it's still on many uh, minds uh, uh, because of it being so low um, a while ago. But that amount has grown consistently uh, through the uh, George W. Bush era. Um, it had some hiccups during the Obama era, and now under the Trump era, it's, it's quite large. Um, however, uh, the, the current tax law does say that in the year 2026, the amount that you can give away is going to be cut in half. So you can see that at the bottom of my slide, that it says that if you die with five million uh, and you're single, then you might have a tax over uh, that five million dollar amount. And right now the tax uh, is 40 percent, so it's a big haircut, uh, 40 percent of anything over that tax-free amount. Also, um, there's discussion uh, in among professionals in my field that if uh, the, the party changes during the next election or any election, you know, thereafter um, to the Democrats, they may look to reduce this uh, tax-free amount um, or make other changes that affect uh, the estate tax. So it is something that is still on our minds. You may have also heard of the gift tax, and so I want to touch on that briefly too. Um, so some smart people, when they heard about the estate tax 100 years ago, decided that if you're going to get taxed at your death, they'll just give away everything during their life. And so on their deathbed or sometime before that, they start giving away all their wealth, thinking that they could avoid the estate tax. So the, the government became wise to that and um, made up something called a gift tax, which says that the government is going to keep track of all the large gifts you make during your life. And they keep track of those things, by the way, by uh, you reporting that you made a gift. And it is the law that you report that you made a large gift. So they'll keep track of that under your social security number. And at your death, they'll uh, see that you see if you gave away more than the tax free amount, the eleven and a half million dollar amount. So what I frequently hear from clients is that they're very familiar with the amount you can give away uh, per year to children, usually children, which is $15,000 right now. It used to be 11 and then it was 12 and it keeps increasing with inflation, but right now it's 15,000 per year. Um, and that's a number that is important because you don't have, the reason it's important is because you don't have to report to the government that you made a gift as long as you give away $15,000 or less uh, per year to an individual. So for example, um, let's say you wanted to buy your son a car and you um, gave him $10,000 so he could buy a car, uh, a beater, a beat up car. Um, you know, you don't have to tell the government that you gave your son $10,000. However, if you gave your son $100,000 to help him uh, put a down payment on a house, um, then that is something you're supposed to report to the government and they'll keep track. Now, it doesn't mean you're taxed because you don't have a gift tax until you've given away more than $11.5 million. But you do have to report it to the government and your CPA can help you with that. Um, if there are any questions, by the way, I'm happy to take any, um, if the host wants to, you know, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to continue on with um, kind of, this is a breaking point where I'm going to continue on with some other parts of the presentation. There is uh, one question that is exactly a very good question. Can you see their questions in the chat question more? Uh, let, let me see if I can. I probably can. Chat. Yeah, if I can, it'll be easier for me to uh, read it, but um, let's see. Ah, here we go, uh, chat. I can ask my question. All right, go ahead and ask, because it's taking me a minute to find the chat feature. Okay, I think my first question, you tried to answer it, but I did not completely get it, so a short reply for me would be fine, um, which it, it was with regard to if a person decides to 
not to give uh, uh, their will to the one of the children. What would be, I mean, so that, that would be, be honored by the court and that child will not receive anything or they will still receive something out of the will, out of the assets of the person that is deceased. Okay, thank you for that good question. Uh, yes, you can uh, exclude a child from, from receiving something from your estate. Uh, you can do it and it's done all the time. Um, it has to be done carefully though. Uh, and I definitely recommend a lawyer's help uh, to make sure that um, you, your will says the right thing um, to make sure that that child cannot uh, dispute it because you are inviting a dispute if you write a child out um, and um, everything gets <clears throat> looked at with more of a microscope I, I found when there is a disgruntled child. Yes, right. Okay. Thank right, you. I have a, another question. question. Another, thank you. I have another question, which is about the age limit of the children which receive the retirement account of the deceased person. What's, up to what age do they receive it? Okay, great. Um, so a retirement account can be, um, can, you can designate your children to receive a retirement account. Um, there is no age limit as to uh, when they can receive it. You can name your minor child to receive a retirement account, um, although that minor child will need a custodian or a guardian to manage it for them. Um, so I highly recommend with many of my clients that they make sure the retirement account is put into a trust um, and appropriately done by a lawyer um, until the, so that it can be held until the child is old enough to handle it. If we're talking about older children um, who are over 18, there really is no uh, age limit. Um, there are different tax laws that uh, come into play about whether that child needs to take distributions out of your uh, retirement account as, as the years go by, um, which are outside the scope of this presentation. But, um, but really, if, if you don't have a spouse uh, that you want to leave your retirement account to, then leaving it to the children is, is usually the right answer. Great, thank you so much. You're welcome. There's, do you want to take another question, Mark, or would you like to continue? Yeah, I, I'd like let's, to ask a question. Let's take one more question, and then I'll move on with the presentation. Okay, there's okay. one question from Dr. Barzik. I should raise her hand first, so I'm going to go by the order that I see folks that are raising their hand. Dr. Barzik? Yeah, I mute myself. Yeah, I mute myself. Thank yeah. you so much, uh, Mr. Brandenburg. Uh, we really enjoyed your, you know, this part of your presentation. I have two questions, very short questions. One is that, uh, is the executor the same as the trustee or could it be the same or are they the same? Thank you for that good question. Um, yes, they can be the same. So you can have the executor who's in charge of your will and making sure that the, the, the directions you provide in your will are uh, met. Um, you can also name, the same person to be the trustee of the trust for your young children that are in your will. Um, or if you have a separate trust called that revocable living trust I mentioned, you could have the same person be the trustee. But there's no requirement that they'd be the same. So what I do with my clients is I usually help my clients find the person that they trust the most in their family um, with financial decisions, uh, with um, organizational matters, and say that's the person that you want to be your trustee and or executor. Uh, so for so many people who are married, it's their spouse. Um, but if it's not your spouse, um, then maybe it's your oldest child, if your child is, is you know, of a mature age, or, or actually any of your children. If any of them are mature, then it could be any of your children. It doesn't matter if it's your oldest or not. Um, and, uh, or it could be your brother or your sister. Um, if there are ways to, to, to um, and that's a big decision that clients make, so I'm glad you asked that question because um, I don't want to overlook it. Um, <clears throat> another uh, consideration is where the uh, person lives. Um, so for example, if you have family in Iran, uh, mm -hmm. you know, w would that family member be a good choice? I would say in most cases, probably not, because that person needs to be here in Georgia um, managing your, your stuff and your house and the banks that you bank at and things like that. 
Um, so that's the kind of thing that is an individual decision, but I, I can help with, or your estate planning lawyer can help with in making that decision. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you for that question. I, I'm going to segue with that actually to one more thing I meant to mention uh, when we talked about estate taxes and, and, and mentioning Iran reminded me of that, that um, when we do talk about estate taxes, um, there are different rules for uh, non-U.S. citizens. So if, um, if anyone is a non-U.S. citizen, um, and does not live here um, as a resident, then there are some different different laws that that, that affect uh, you. So just wanted to make sure that I made that comment in case uh, anyone here is listening or has family that they know of um, who might have different laws apply to them. Mark, I will finish and then I'll let them raise the question. Can you do that? Yeah, so I'll finish. I'll continue with my presentation, then we can do more questions at the end, okay? Thank you very much. Great. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So for the next uh, portion of the, of the uh, evening, I wanted to go over um, some really important estate planning uh, concepts that affect you while you're alive. The first one is guardianship and conservatorship. So if you lose mental capacity to make your own decisions, you may need a guardian or a conservator. A guardian is a person with the legal authority and duty to take care of someone else's person or healthcare needs. So for example, if you are hospitalized uh, with COVID and <clears throat> you cannot make decisions for yourself anymore because you're on a ventilator about medical treatment, who does the hospital go to? Well, they, they should go to a legal, uh, a legal representative and that person would be a guardian for you if you don't have um, a, another document that I'll talk about in a few minutes. All right, so that's what a guardian is. A conservator is a person who is also appointed by a court and has the legal authority to take care of your finances. Uh, so for example, I had a, a client um, who was generally healthy um, in his uh, late 50s and uh, he was doing one of those boot camp, uh, boot camp exercise classes and got in uh, his car after it was over and suddenly felt lightheaded and had a heart attack. Um, and he survived, thank goodness. And his buddy saw that he was in trouble and drove him to the emergency room immediately. Um, and even though he survived, he was in the hospital for three weeks, uh, basically in a medically induced coma until um, the doctors could make sure he was all right and get him back to health. So during those three weeks, um, his, uh, his family was in, um, in a, not only in a, a tizzy about his, his, his health, but also about what to do about his businesses. This was a client who had his hands in several different businesses um, and no one really knew what he was doing because these were his private businesses. Um, but somebody needed to continue to write the checks to the employees and someone needed to, um, you know, manage uh, the operations. And so uh, when that happened, uh, the family had to go get a conservator tour for him uh, through the probate court. And I really wish that he had had a document uh, that would have uh, resolved that uh, called a power of attorney. And we'll talk about that in a minute. I'm going to skip over this slide. All right. So power of attorney. A power of attorney is a document that you can sign while you're alive and while you have uh, mental capacity that names an agent to transact business for you. So that your family, if you're the one who, um, who has the heart attack, uh, so your family can uh, have legal authority to manage your affairs without going to the probate court and asking that a conservator be appointed for you. A conservatorship has a lot of oversight uh, that, that you don't, it's a burden, you don't want it. Um, but naming an agent and a power of attorney is a very simple uh, way to just dis designate to everyone who you want to be in charge of your stuff. And for most people, that's their spouse. And if it's not your spouse, maybe it's your mature child um, or it's your you know, sibling or, or some other family member. Um, there are different kinds of powers of attorney. So if you hear that term being used, there are limited powers of attorney and there are general powers of attorney. Um, I'm talking about a general 
durable power of attorney, meaning that it's durable even if you become incompetent. And it's general, meaning that your agent will be able to do just about anything that you could do for yourself. There's also immediate powers of attorney and springing ones. An immediate one means that when you sign the document at your lawyer's office, it immediately designates your agent to be able to make financial transactions on your behalf. And since you trust your agent, because your agent might be your spouse or your uh, wonderful child, uh, you, know, you don't mind making, giving that person immediate authority. If you have a, a concern about the agent, you might choose something called springing, which means that they don't get any authority now, but they get it once you become incompetent. There's also um, a, a healthcare uh, power of attorney, which names an agent to make healthcare decisions for you. This would avoid, if you sign this with, uh, you know, in advance while you're, while you're feeling good and have mental capacity, um, you can avoid your family the difficulty of going to the court to become your guardian. Instead, you just name an agent who will make healthcare decisions for you. And uh, if you're ill and can't make decisions for yourself anymore, the doctors will know exactly who to go to to, uh, to have decisions made on your behalf. In Georgia, we have uh, a document called an Advanced Directive for Healthcare. In other states, it may be called other things, but in Georgia, this is the name we've designated for it. And um, about 15 years ago, uh, this document was created by the Georgia legislature and by uh, lawyers and medical professionals all coming together and coming up with one document that they all thought was, was um, the best document for Georgia residents. And what they did at the time was they took two other documents that many people had and combined them into one. So on, my, on the slide right here, you'll see on the left-hand side, there's a box that says healthcare power of attorney, uh, and there's a box that says living will. So the healthcare power of attorney is the, the kind of power of attorney I just described where you name an agent to make medical decisions for you if you can't make them for yourself. The living will at the bottom is uh, another kind of directive where um, you can decide how you'd like the end of your life treatment to be handled by your medical professionals. Um, so some people uh, you know, describe that as sh should they pull the plug or not. Um, I don't love that, but I, I know that the people, uh, I don't love that phrase, but I know that people um, understand that. Um, it, it's a way for you to designate uh, what you'd want done if you either have a terminal condition where it's likely that there's no treatment and you're going to die, or if you, um, or if you are in a, what is called a state of permanent unconsciousness which some people call a vegetative state. And many people will remember the Terry Schiavo case uh, from Florida where she was in that kind of state. Um, and would, would you want to remain alive as long as machines will keep you alive or do you want to, um, to die? And, and that's a, a difficult decision for everybody. It's even more difficult for your family to make that decision uh, without knowing what you would want. And so, uh, in Georgia, we have the Advanced Directive for Healthcare, where you can designate your agent and tell your family and your doctors what you'd want done uh, if you faced one of these uh, tragic circumstances. And it's a document that everyone should have, especially during uh, this time of, of pandemic. Um, so I highly recommend it. And it's not a very um, difficult document uh, as, as far as um, uh, obtaining it. In fact, many will get it from the hospital that itself and will fill it out on their own without a lawyer's help. Um, so I highly recommend um, getting that done. But most estate planning lawyers like me will include that as a package of estate planning documents. So with that, I wanted to kind of close with some takeaways before we go through question and answer. Um, I really feel that it's important that you establish a relationship with your estate planning lawyer. Uh, estate planning, in, in my view, is not something that should be done on your own using, uh, using a website. Um, that, because really the value that an estate planning lawyer provides is not in the documents themselves, 
but in the relationship that you have with that lawyer. So to know that he or she is uh, guiding you to make the right decisions, uh, that he or she knows Georgia law and will apply your case to, to that law. And also that know that that person, he or she will be there for your family uh, to implement the plan when you're no longer around. So that your family has someone they can call uh, when something happens to you and you can trust that that person will, uh, that lawyer will guide the family through the next steps. So I, I think that everyone should have a plan. Um, and if you don't right now, that's okay. Uh, it's okay that you haven't yet, uh, but it's time to start thinking about having one and taking those steps to do it. Uh, you should certainly have a will or a revocable living trust. You should certainly have a power of attorney and you should certainly have the advanced directive for healthcare. Um, and it's, so uh, it's worth your time and your money, uh, to, to make sure you have those in place. It'll save you a lot. It'll save your family and a lot of time and a lot of money in the long run. Uh, so with that, thank you. I'll, I'll open it up to questions. Well, maybe, maybe I'll raise a question myself first. If you didn't, you correct me, I'm not right. You cannot get Medicaid if you go to nursing home or assistant living. You have to, in seven, you cannot go transfer your property the year before. They go back to seven years. Am I correct? You understand what I'm saying? I do. Thank you, Dr. Faroki. Yeah, that's a good question. Them, they think if you go in and Medicare take care of me. No. Medicare goes seven years before to see what you transfer to your children or your ideas somebody. Can you explain to them? I, I'd be happy to. Uh, so what the question is, um, is, is really the question is, when can you qualify for Medicaid? And I want to be clear about the difference between Medicaid and Medicare. Uh, I'm sure many of you who uh, I'm sure are familiar with Medicare. That, apply, that is a government uh, program for everyone over a certain age uh, to pay for your medical expenses. Uh, Medicaid is something different. Medicaid is a needs-based government program. It's intended only for those who don't have the resources to pay for their own uh, nursing home or in-home care. Um, and so because it, uh, it is needs-based, you basically need to be um, uh, you know, impoverished in order to qualify. Uh, I think the, the amount of resources you're allowed to have right now is about $2,000 in your name. Uh, now there are, so, so, so in order to qualify for Medicaid, there are a lot of ways that, um, that people will try to qualify and get the benefits uh, that they can achieve. Um, but there are some people who will try to give away their assets to become impoverished. And there is something called a look back period, which is what Dr. Faroki is describing, where um, if you try to qualify for Medicaid, they will, the government will look back to see if you've been making big gifts in order to become impoverished. And if you have, they will uh, assess a penalty which will delay your ability to get on Medicaid. Can you take these things off? People can see your uh, audience. Can you? Yes, audience? thank you for reminding me that. I will stop sharing that. Okay. okay. There is a is that... If you don't mind, I'll go through the list. Uh, I'll, I'll... Sure. So raising their hand, I'll, I'll ask them in order to speak. Uh, Dr. Molarisi, you're up next. Uh, th thank you very much for an excellent presentation. I got two quick questions. One is, if your uh, properties are all jointly owned with your spouse and your, you know, your beneficiary and all that stuff for IRAs and annuities and all that stuff, uh, is there anything? Uh, you need to do either in terms of will or estate planning. Uh, secondly, second question is that as any overseas property, can that be covered through any kind of a document in the US? Okay, thank you for that. Um, all right, let me make sure I write, write down the second question before I forget it. Okay, um, the first question is, um, is a good one um, and um, 
you know what? I just forgot the first one. This is what happens when you ask two questions. Can you just repeat the first one again? I promise uh, I'll remember. If, if everything you have is jointly owned with the oh, yes. spouse. Okay, that's all. I remember now. Is I remember the beneficiary now. for everything else. Yeah. Okay, got it. Uh, yes, so the question is, if you jointly own property, um, do you need to think about a will or anything else? Uh, because um, at your death, when you have everything jointly owned or everything in non-probate assets, um, it'll all go to the surviving person on that account or uh, through that policy. Um, that is an okay way to avoid probate when you're married and um, your spouse survives you. But your spouse, uh, once she or he survives you, will then be the sole owner of all those assets and uh, he or she will need an estate plan. Um, so it is generally recommended that you go ahead and do a plan um, now for everybody, uh, cause you don't know, you know, you might both be in a car accident and one of you dies, um, d at the time of the accident and the other one dies a month later as a result of the injuries. Uh, you may not have time to plan, uh, in the future. Um, so that's, that's what I'll say about that. Um, the second question, um, is, is if you have assets overseas, um, does a U.S. document govern those? Uh, the answer is no. Um, so let's say you own a house in Iran and you, uh, of course, live here in, in, in the United States. Um, you should have an Iranian will uh, or, or whatever the equivalent is done by an Iranian lawyer to make sure that that property passes according to the laws of that country and, and that region. Because I do know there are different laws around the world. I don't know all of them, of course, but I know there are some laws that might surprise you. Uh, I think I've even read there are some laws in some countries that you know that a, like a daughter can't receive an inheritance. And so you just want to make sure that your lawyer helps you um, do the right thing with that asset. Thank you. Our next question is from Ms. Dawoodian. You will unmute yourself. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much for a uh, very informative uh, presentation. I have a question. If I, would I be able to write in my will that if my children are married and they get divorced, none of the stuff that I give them or I left for them um, be divided in half and goes to the wife? Is okay, this thank you. For, yes, thank you for that good question. And thank you for, for joining us tonight. Um, that's a good question, is what happens um, if you leave an inheritance for your child and then your child has a creditor, like a divorced spouse, um, or maybe even a bad business deal or, or some other form of creditor. Um, if you leave your inheritance to them outright, meaning there's no trust for them, it just goes right into their pocket, uh, then it is not going to be, be protected from divorcing spouses. Um, <clears throat> so that's something that is a concern for some, some parents. And the way to avoid that is to put that inheritance inside of a trust that's uh, baked into your will. So, you know, it's, it's when I die, uh, my will will say that um, I leave, you know, an equal amount to each of my children of my uh, assets, and that amount will go in, into a trust for my child's benefit. If your if your child is is mature, then you could even name that child to be the trustee of her own trust. Um, so that's okay. But the benefit of keeping the money in that trust is that um, the lawyer who drafted the will for you would put a a, a provision in there saying that this money will always be held uh, protected from divorcing spouses and other creditors. And so it's separate from your child's other assets. Thank you. You're welcome. Next question, I believe Ms. Park had a question earlier and then I'll go after the other. Ms. Park? I also have a question. I see that. I thought I was yeah. I'm just giving her a chance. Okay. Ms. Clark. Okay, we'll go up. Let me see. The next person is uh, Dr. Lazigan. Go ahead. Yes, once again, thank you so, so much, you know, for your informative uh, 
presentation, you know, it was really nice and we didn't know any of that, you know. But I have, again, two questions, you know. One is that what do we do about, you know, other properties, other, you know, belongings, other assets, you know, like, for instance, carpets, antiques, you know, uh, jewelry, etc. that it would be absolutely covered by law that this one goes to this child and that one goes to the other child, you know, so that there is no conflict in between. That's my first question. Okay. Uh, how about I'll go ahead and answer that one and then you'll give me the second one next. Uh, okay. So I don't forget, yes. I don't forget the first one. Okay. Sure. Um, in my profession, we call what you just described tangible personal property. Uh, tangible personal property is anything you can touch and move. Uh, and that includes your home furnishings. It includes your uh, personal effects, uh, photographs, letters, uh, jewelry, china, um, you know, anything that, uh, anything like that. And those have so much sentimental value to people um, that I've seen some of the ugliest fights among family members yeah. over things like that, um, that don't necessarily have a lot of monetary value. Uh, and certainly don't, even when they do sometimes have monetary value, uh, like art or, or rugs or, or silver, um, it, it, people are willing to fight for, for them and spend much more money in the fight than, than they would cost to go buy those somewhere else. Um, so that's a really important question. And a will will describe um, how those belongings will be divided. Uh, most wills will say something like, um, you know, everything, you know, all of my tangible personal property will go to my spouse. But if my spouse is not alive at the time of my death, then it will all go to my children in equal shares as they shall, uh, as they shall decide among themselves. And if they can't decide among themselves, then my executor will be the one who makes the final decisions about who gets what. And also a will might say something like, um, you know, it, it, recognizing it's impossible to equally divide personal property um, in many cases. So the executor is going to try and do it as, as uh, carefully as possible. Um, that's one way to handle this. Um, another way is to have a much more detailed provision in your will that maybe even describes a lottery system. You know, if you know your children are going to fight, you can have a lottery system where each one of them gets a choice of your belongings in your house. Yeah. Um, to try and make it as fair as possible. Yeah. Um, but the way I like to handle this the best is that to put it on you, uh, is that you make a list of the items that you want to go to certain family members um, or to charities or you know, whoever you think should get this, this property. You make a list and we can attach that list to your will so that it'll be respected um, by your survivors. Um, but that way we know what it is you wanted to do with your valuable personal belongings rather than um, everyone kind of say, because often it's, well, she told me at, at uh, you know, at Christmas dinner or something that, that I was going to get such and such. And um, it, it, it never really, um, it, it's hard to identify that. Also, the last thing I'll say on this point, if, if you happen to be um, getting, um, to a point where you're ready to, to part with your uh, sentimental items and valuable items, I suggest you go ahead and do it. Do it while you're alive and, and uh, can make the decision and you can tell your, your kids why you gave uh, you know, the rug to one child and not the other, maybe because one child has a house and the other is living in a Manhattan apartment and doesn't need a rug uh, of that size. You know, just go ahead and do it so that um, there's no fighting about it afterwards. All right, I'm ready for your second question. Certain properties and then something happens that you sell, you know, some of them or you buy more. So uh, what, what do you do? Again, you have to go to the attorney to write an addendum or something or what happens? Okay, a good, another good question. What happens if, if you come up with a list of personal property and then that list of items you own changes? Um, you're, you're bringing up the reason why I don't like to put a list of personal property in the will itself. 
because there are many wills, you may have one yourself or you've seen others do it where, uh, you know, the lawyer drafts who's going to get which item in your house. And every time you make a change, you do have to go back to the lawyer to have that lawyer fix the list. Mm -hmm. So I prefer that you make your own list on, a, on another piece of paper and we will reference it in the will. And then um, you can keep updating that piece of paper every time you make a change, you know, every year or so, if you want to, you just send your lawyer the updated list and whichever list is the last one at your death, that's the one that will be used as the, the guide. Mark, I have inventory lists if anybody wants it, it's all in my hand. Inventory for every person. <laughs> that's great, that's great. You see that? 10, 15 pages, if you want it, I give it to you. From furniture to shoes to anything you want to, it's here. Tangible, intangible. That's very helpful, that's very helpful. Thank you, thank you, sir, thank you so much. Okay, yeah. I have a question. I have a question, um, Mr. Brandenburg. Uh, my name is Mahin Park, and um, my question is, if you write whatever you have, and then you can go ahead and add on to it or change it, um, but what if you wanna, you ha already have a will, and you wanna modify it because things have happened, you know, your life has changed, uh, can you just uh, write a codicil um, at, as a, like, um, mention it in your will that uh, the codicil exists, and then in the codicil make the modifications. Because what I did, um, I made that codicil myself, and um, I got it from um, uh, WikiHow or something, you know, the, the form, and then uh, on, I went ahead and um, used it as an addendum to the will because everything was in place, everything you mentioned exists for us, but um, I just wanted to, for those uh, small changes. Um, is that um, acceptable by the law? Okay, thank you for that question. So, so for those who aren't as knowledgeable as you, uh, I just wanna make sure everyone knows what a codicil is. A codicil is a legal term for an amendment to a will. Um, so if you have a will and you want to update it with, by making a change, you can uh, attach a codicil, which republishes, the, the word is republishes the original will, except for the changes that you're making in your codicil. Um, so you can, do, you can do what you described. Um, and I do recommend that everyone review their will and other estate planning documents, uh, certainly every three to five years. And and when there's been a, a major life event um, in, your, in, your, in your life, you know, you had a divorce or you lost a spouse or, um, you know, you, you changed states, uh, you know, you used to live in North Carolina and now you live in Georgia, whatever it may be. Um, I, uh, I do caution though, by doing a codicil on your own, uh, I do, of course I'm biased since, since I'm a lawyer who makes a living doing this, but I do uh, highly recommend that you have a lawyer review what you did. Um, Codicils, just like wills, need to be uh, signed with the proper formalities in order for them to survive the probate process. And I've seen uh, individuals do codicils where they just didn't know better and they did it wrong. Um, like you need to have two witnesses and uh, you might like to have a notary as well sign an affidavit attached to it. Um, you know, there also may be change. So I'm glad, I hope you did that right, and if you did, super, but a lot of people don't, and so I wanna make sure everyone else hears that. And then there's also, um, uh, there's also other changes that happen that you may not be aware of in the years since you last did a will. Um, I have a lot of clients who still have very complex uh, wills because they were trying to avoid the estate tax from 15 or 20 years ago which now with proper guidance, we can talk about maybe eliminating some of that complexity, um, depending on what your, your, what your wealth situation is. Um, you know, there's also a lot of other laws that change in, in the interim. Um, the laws are updated. Uh, for example, we now have laws in Georgia about um, digital assets, like the photographs that you have saved in, in your iCloud uh, or your email address, your email accounts where maybe you have 
uh, letters that you, you know, or your emails that you've sent to family that you want preserved um, after you're gone so your family can use them like we used to keep letters, uh, you know, in, in the shoebox. Um, so there's a lot of things that, that old wills may not address those kinds of newer things. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one more question. If you yeah, all want to raise their hand, please give I everybody a chance to ask question. There's Ms. Rushman is next, please. Yes, please I will ask my question. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you so much, Mark, for your very great presentation. And uh, my question is, does a person have to do their will in a, an attorney's office or they can do it notarized, go to the notary and notarize, write it down and notarize it only? Okay, thank you for that good question. Um, I highly recommend that a lawyer be, be the one who drafts your, your will. Uh, I, of course, I'm familiar that there are websites where you can go to get a form uh, where you can do it on your own. Um, I have seen some of the worst of that, where it, it, it creates a bigger problem for the family after, your, after the, the deceased uh, is gone. Um, but I'm sure there are examples of those working out fine as well. Um, it's just risky, in my opinion. Um, so you know, I highly recommend a lawyer do the drafting. If your question is, is do, do you need to sign a drafted document in a lawyer's office? The answer to that is no. Um, you know, as long as you have two witnesses and a notary who are all in the same room, or at least can all see each other, I should say, um, then that is one of the requ requirements under Georgia law. And we've been, we in my profession have been working uh, hard to try and figure out how to do this under the, the new the new world we live in, where it is sometimes not safe or uh, to be in the same space with other people. Um, and so the, the governor has allowed some uh, will executions to be done, uh, execution means signing, uh, to, to be done um, remotely, like we're talking to each other now. Um, but even those have very specific uh, rules that need to be followed. So, uh, you know, a lawyer is the best person to make sure it's done right so that it holds up when, uh, when you die. Correct. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Daniels is next. Ms. Daniels. Okay, my question is about um, the, 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 the trust. When uh, instead of giving it to your children, you were talking about in case they get divorced or something, and is, it, is it easier to just uh, make a trust for your grandchildren and have your children to be their trustee? So in the event that the divorce should happen, the children, the grandchildren actually get the money. Uh, thank you for that, that good comment. Um, if it's appropriate for your family, then, then that, that, it, that could be a, a solution, um, particularly if you're concerned that your adult child uh, may, may get divorced, um, then you could just go ahead and set up a trust for the children. Um, I mean, ultimately, though, the, the, the money will, might be, the money might remain in trust long enough that even your grandchildren become adults uh, while the money is still there. Um, if it's used, uh, you know, used in a prudent way, maybe it's just used for, for education um, or for, uh, you know, um, really summer, uh, summer, vac summer trips or something that are educational. Um, then the money may still be there. And so your, your grandchild might also become an adult and, and uh, might also face some of those same challenges. Um, so there's a, a balance that every uh, person needs to work out and, and their lawyer can help them talk about it, um, about how much you want to control um, after you're gone. Um, and that's where trusts can be helpful is you can control a lot of behavior after you're gone. Um, but you have to decide uh, just how much you want to do um, do that. And so for every family, there's maybe a different result. Well, what, 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 excuse me, what about the liquid assets like stocks and cash and st stuff like that? Although on those you can designate who you want it to go, but if those designee are still not old enough, then you need the trustee to hold that money in the trust, right? Even although it says in there that your grandchildren's name, but if they are not adults, so somebody has to be the trustee for that. Right or wrong? Uh, thank you, you're right. Um, so if you, if you leave any inheritance to someone under the age of 18, 
um, hopefully your your will um, well, well your will either might say something uh, about leaving that money for a custodian for the minor child <clears throat> if you don't leave the money inside of a trust um, or uh, even if your will doesn't say anything about a custodian uh, Georgia law has a a a custodial uh, act that will allow an, an, an adult to hold money for an individual. The, the problem with that, I believe, is that um, that custodial act, uh, which is called the Uniform Transfers to Minors Act, uh, says that when the child becomes 21, they must be given the money outright. And 21 years old is better than 18, but is still not a great time, in my opinion, for uh, a young adult to be receiving a, a handful of cash, um, you know, an, an entire inheritance. So I would usually recommend a trust to hold an inheritance until the young adult is at least 35 years old. Um, that's usually the age that people feel that, that a person is mature enough to handle um, a significant amount of wealth. I, I also have a quick question. How do you maintain digital assets? How do you maintain digital assets? Okay, I'll briefly talk about that. It's a little bit outside the scope, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. But um, as far as digital assets go, um, you, you, you're, for example, with, um, with Apple or with Google, um, there is a, uh, in, in the system preferences uh, that you have on those accounts, there's a way to designate who would be your agent to access uh, those accounts after you die. Facebook is another one, by the way. You know, you may have heard or read that, that in Facebook, if you die, your account is frozen and no one can get into, into it and it becomes a memorial account um, where people can post their, you know, their comments uh, uh, memorializing your life but you may not be able to get the images back. So, so Facebook and others have a place on their website where you can name a person to have access if you can't access it yourself. And you usually name your spouse or your, you know, your adult child. But um, it's still a good idea to have a general document like in your will that describes um, in case there's any doubt uh, who would be in charge or in case the, uh, the technology changes. You know, we're using Facebook now, in 10 years, I don't know what technology, what the software will be that we'll be using. We, maybe none of us have ever heard of it before, just like none of us heard of Zoom uh, you know, a year ago. Uh, so uh, it's good to have a document that, that uh, can be flexible depending on what happens at the time of your death. Thank you so uh, much. Before, we have a question from Dr. Budayasi, but before that, there's a question posted in the uh, chat, if you would, Mark, there's from the Okay. What is a reasonable charge for a real trust and power of attorney? Are there firms that one can join or pay monthly fees for these services? Okay, thank you for that good question. Uh, that's a, a hard question to answer, um, but I, I will do my best um, because there are different. So the question is, you know, what is a reasonable uh, amount of money to pay for a will, a trust, power of attorney? Um, and, and my firm. Um, we would do that as a package. And I think most estate planning lawyers in, in Georgia do it as a package where uh, you come and you get the will and the power of attorney and the advanced directive and any other uh, document that, that, um, that we determine is right for you. Um, I mean, I think on the very low end, uh, I've heard of lawyers who do it for $1,500. Um, there are also lawyers who will do that kind of package for uh, $10,000 or more. Um, in, you know, in, in my firm, uh, we are somewhere in the range between $2,500 and $7,500, uh, depending on um, the, uh, the kinds of provisions and kinds of plan you, that's right for you. And one of the things I do is I help you uh, determine what is right for you, and then you, know, you can decide which package uh, fits, within, fits with your needs. Um, there are some there are some lawyers I'm familiar with that do have a monthly, uh, a monthly like, membership program um, where you get some benefits uh, if you're part of the program, like maybe you get updates uh, on your documents for a discounted rate. Uh, that's something I'm looking into doing, but I haven't started yet uh, for myself. Um, and, uh, and I think that answers the question. Right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Malaresi, next. After that is Dr. Hamidi. 
And I think we're going to try to cut it short after that because we've kept our guests yeah. for a long time. Thanks, Mark. Go ahead, Dr. Williams. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, uh, question is, uh, if somebody has made a will, you know, when they have minor children and so on, and then, you know, uh, they have basically updated, you know, that's a friend of mine was in that situation and they just want to uh, not, uh, you know, most of it doesn't apply. I and mean, some of it may apply, but most of it may not apply. Can they just, you know, assume, how can they assume that they don't have a will or do they always have to update the will? Okay. Um, you know, I think whether or not you need to update a will is a decision that uh, is, is best made with you and your lawyer together. Uh, you know, you are the one who knows what's changed in your life and whether you, maybe you've, you decisions that you made a, a number of years ago are different than the ones you want to make now. Uh, your lawyer can also advise you about what's changed in the law and how that might impact you under current law. Um, I think it's a good idea to have your documents reviewed every three to five years by a lawyer um, to make sure they still um, do what you want them to do. So I, and, I guess, uh, yeah. Mark, I guess my question was that if, if somebody, you know, uh, when they have a, you know, minor children and then mm -hmm. when they, the children grow up, maybe they don't, you know, they want to, to default to the, you know, non-probate stuff. Is that still doable or do they okay. have to, to update to it? I understand. Um, you, you can, um, yeah, if, if a will uh, is not needed because you have no probate assets, then, um, and then you die, then the will just gets, uh, you know, tucked away, uh, you know, and is never implemented. Um, so if you have an old will and the rest of your assets are governed by other methods, then you don't have to worry about it. Um, if you do have a probate asset, and you just haven't updated your will in 20 years, uh, you know, you, you did a will when, you're, when you had your first child as a baby and you haven't updated it since, and a lot of, a lot of people I run across are in that situation, um, that document is probably still okay. Uh, you know, lawyers like me try to create documents that will last a long time because we don't know if this is the last time you're going to be in our office, uh, and, and it may be decades before you come back. Um, so just because someone turns 18 does not necessarily mean that a document needs to be updated. Thank you. Is there one more question I thought? Who is next? Yeah, we have one more question from Dr. Hamidi, please. Okay. Hi, thank you, Mr. Vandenberg, for um, this session. Uh, my question is, uh, in case of a death, let's say a death has occurred and there is a will, um, just wanted to know in practical terms, how does implementation of the will get started? Is it up to the, um, uh, I mean, who starts the, the will process? How does that started? Okay, thank you uh, for that good question. Uh, and that's a good one for me to close on. Um, when someone dies, uh, you know, usually with after a, a week or two of mourning, uh, the family starts to decide, you know, what do we do with the stuff that's left behind? And uh, the family will need to identify where the will is. Uh, most lawyers who do wills will keep their original will in their safe. That's something I do in my firm. I have a safe full of clients' wills. Uh, because the original, the one where you actually signed your name in wet ink, um, is the document that needs to be presented to the probate court to be, uh, to be probated. Uh, so that document needs to be found, and then that document describes who is the executor that you named, and that's the person who comes forward and uh, goes through the process of probating the will in the probate court to get the legal authority in order to continue uh, managing your estate and collecting and preserving your assets until, uh, you know, paying creditors until they can distribute your assets to the people you wanted them to be distributed to. So again, that's, I just wanted to thank everyone for uh, joining me tonight. This has been a pleasure of mine to, to see your faces and to speak with you um, and your great questions and great audience. Thank, thank you so much, Mark, for doing this for us. On behalf of Amir, thank you very much. On behalf of Amir.
Thank you, Dr. Froke. It's a pleasure. Thank you all for joining us. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.